Please welcome to the stage Sho Chu, CEO of TikTok, for a conversation with Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde. Wonderful to be here in this room. Wonderful to have you next to me. Sho. Thank you for having me. So I was going to start with the new story of growth being wherever I sit at the moment, and I'm biased because I cover technology in particular, being artificial intelligence. But then I knew there were a few elephants in the room that I felt we should address more immediately. So your company has just decided to sue the state of Montana in the United States because they want to ban the use of TikTok for new users, all users, by January the 1st, 2024. Why take that tack? How do you think you can fight this from a legal perspective? Caroline, um, thanks for having me. The, we believe that the Montana bill that was recently passed is simply unconstitutional. Mm. And as you pointed out, we very recently filed a lawsuit to challenge this in the courts. And we are confident that we will prevail. Um, separately, you know, I've noticed that some of our creators have also filed a separate lawsuit challenging the same bill in the courts. And I do want to say that you know, they care because TikTok is really important to them. Mm. And this is the part of the story that I think is the most important part you know, of TikTok, which is that now that we have more than 150 million Americans on our platform on a very active basis, more than a billion around the world, you know, people use TikTok as a place for expression. It's a very different experience, as you may know, from the other apps that are available in the market. You know, this is one for discovery, for expression, for free expression. And a lot of our users use TikTok to find their communities, to discover, and to express themselves. Yeah. You know, moreover, you know, there are five million small businesses in the United States that depend on TikTok, and millions more around the world, including here in this country and in the region. So I, I think you know, ultimately it is about providing value to these users and making sure that you know, we continue to provide them with a great service that benefits them. And that's um, you know, our key focus at this moment in time. Expressing oneself, was that quite hard to express yourself most recently when you were in Congress, when you were having to try and tell your story of why TikTok is important to the United States? Uh, <laughs> I, I think it was a very important process, and I'm very uh, grateful for the opportunity to show up and to tell our side of the story. You know, Could you I, tell your side of the story? Uh, throughout the five hours, uh, I believe I had time to do that. Yeah. And I think it's a good opportunity for us to explain ourselves because there are some myths and misconceptions about our company out there. Uh, dig into them because the key issue that many would have is data and the concern, the anxiety that ultimately the Chinese government can have access to US user data. That is why Montana is wanting to ban TikTok. What do you wish you could have said to make that land that that isn't going to happen? Because it felt as though you didn't manage to prove that point. Well, TikTok is not available in mainland China today. Uh, as we said many times, the Chinese government has actually never asked us for US user data, and we will not provide even if asked. Now, beyond that, we have built over the last two years um, something we call internally Project Texas. And what it really is, is to ensure that American data is stored on American soil by an American company and overseen by American personnel. And this is a, truly an unprecedented project that none of, our, uh, none of the other companies in our industry have ever attempted. And we believe that we have taken steps that are above and beyond what our industry has done to protect the safety of US user data, which is very important. Where are you with Project Texas? Because there's been some reporting, and I know that you've come out and said very soon Oracle will have the unprecedented access to our data, or indeed to your, the ways in which of your source code. But that's not now. When will Oracle be able to enact this sort of unprecedented overseeing and transparency of, of your company? Uh, project Texas is a very complicated project. And a lot of the elements of the project is already in place and operational. Uh, for example, today, by default, all US data is stored 
in the Oracle Cloud service already, in the Oracle Cloud infrastructure, and no longer in our own servers in Virginia and in Singapore. You've already done that transfer? It's already done by default, correct. Um, separately, Oracle has begun the, source, the, the review of the code, although it's, uh, as you can understand, you know, a complicated project that will take time for us to finish the details. So it's on track. Oracle and ourselves are working together with the US government to finalize the details of Project Texas. There's also, I believe, Project Clover in Europe, which yes. is a similar idea. And what's so interesting is your industry is grappling with this issue at the moment. The fact that we're sort of almost getting a nationalization, a sovereignty argument for data. And we've just seen Meta, which I know the artist formerly known as Facebook, where you were once an intern, has just been issued a fine for keeping its data in Europe or not, as the case may be. That's what's argued by the EU regulators. What do you make of this almost deglobalization that's occurring in technology? I think you, this is a very important uh, topic that you are uh, you're touching on. Now, on the one hand, the internet is really built on this idea of global interoperability. And, the, I, and the, this idea that talent from around the world can connect very seamlessly mm. with each other. And I think we've all seen the benefits of a very connected global internet over the last few decades. And I continue to be a big proponent of that. I think there's so many important elements of this global interoperability that needs to be preserved. Now, at the same time, um, there are conversations now in the EU, in, in the US, and in other countries around the world about what they call data sovereignty, you know, making sure that there are certain elements of the data. You know, data is a very big term, so we need to make sure that we are very specific about what we are talking about. You know, certain elements of protected data, for example, are stored and handled in a particular way in each um, region. And that's something that I believe we are ahead of the curve, because Project Texas in the United States is really sort of a project that deals with digital sovereignty in the US. And because we have so much learning from that project, uh, we started Project Clover, a very, very similar project for Europe, um, starting a few uh, months ago now. And the idea is very similar. You know, we are building our data centers in Ireland, in Norway, localizing the storage of data in Europe, you know, building um, additional data access protocols, but adapted for GDPR, which mm -hmm. is the regulation within, within the EU. And uh, we believe that this is an important conversation, and we are slightly ahead of the curve. And I think that you know, we need to simultaneously address the concerns about, you know, and the desire for digital sovereignty, while making sure that we don't break the internet, that we don't balkanize this, and we continue to enjoy the benefits of a seamlessly connected global internet. Do you think that argument can land? And in particular, do you think there's a point at which you're going to be able to turn to US Congress or an EU regulator and say, without doubt, there will be no backdoor to any government, whether it be the Chinese government or never wants to have their data? Like one previous, well, employee of ByteDance is currently saying does exist, a backdoor does exist for the Chinese government. Uh, I just want to address uh, that particular person left the company in 2018. Uh, so a lot of what he said is baseless in, in our, from our point of view. Uh, but to your question, I think the you know, security, data security is a never-ending project. You know, any company that comes to you and says, we are 100% safe from any threats, is probably underestimating the problem because threats can exist externally and internally, domestic or foreign. You know, this, is, uh, this is true for any company that deals with you know, data at some scale. So what we commit to is that we will take this extremely seriously, that we will continue to invest to make sure that our data is as safe as possible. Mm. But to ask any company to promise that, you know, this is 100% safe from all threats, I think this is not something that any company can reasonably promise. Project Clover and Project Texas, we believe, are unprecedented proje uh, projects that we're putting in place that will allow the data to not only be stored locally, but to be managed by local employees, and to, be, and to have third-party local companies to give that, um, uh, to give that system you know, its um, monitoring. And this is something that goes above and beyond that any company in our industry has pursued so far. Mm -hmm. So we're confident that this is a very robust solution. And you're using technology to try and fix a perceived problem. Where could artificial intelligence be used 
for moderation as well as for content creation and news ways in which your creators can be producing video that much faster, for example? Uh, th the recent coverage on AI reminds me of this great quote that says um, something along the lines of, it took me 10 years to be an overnight success. <laughs> so th the industry has been developing and evolving for a very significant period of time. And uh, we have incorporated some elements of machine learning, for example, in our recommendation algorithm. Our recommendation algorithm is just math. Yeah. And in order to pr pr process all these numbers across so many users, uh, we need to leverage machine learning. So it, it is at the core of the offering that we are giving to our users, and it's good. You know, people discover a lot of joyful content because of our recommendation algorithm. Now, beyond that, uh, some of the latest developments, particularly by, by OpenAI and you know, the ChatGPT product, is, um, could be very profound for productivity. Um, there are many elements like content moderation um, or creation as a creation tool for many of our users on our platform that could be unlocked with this new technology. It's, it's very exciting. I just want to go to our audience because you have control within this conversation. You can partake in a poll, for example. I want to put to you a question currently that we're wondering as to whether artificial intelligence will change the way in which you use social media in all its forms. Yes, it will be vastly changing your relationship with social media. You'll be making avatars left, right, and center. Maybe you already think AI is within the world of social media and it's already being leveraged. Or do you not think it'll change at all? I'm gonna give you a moment to get into your app, give me your answer, but to that point, your own AI, you mentioned open AI there. Would you ever build your own large language model at TikTok? Would it be beneficial? I think it's um, a very interesting development in the industry. And of course, there are many companies that are leading in this. And we're still in the process of making sure that we understand and study this. Mm -hmm. So that's the stage that we are at at this moment in time. Okay, being debated. There's a lot of optimism and hope around artificial intelligence. There's also a lot of caution and concern. How do you regulate it? How do you look at ensuring that this doesn't make people out of work? Or indeed, how do we ensure that perhaps the AI effects that I can use within TikTok doesn't make everyone think that anyone can be beautiful, anyone can be glamorous. I'm thinking of one particularly uh, famous AI filter that you have, Glamour Filter. You are, I know, a man who thinks a lot about ensuring safety on the product. You're a man of two children who are eventually going, their world is created around technology. How's, how safe and secure and, and built for a healthy relationship with technology, do you think TikTok is? This is a very important uh, question. I, I think not only for us, but for people that will come after us. Um, the progress, the current progress of AI is truly very exciting. It's, it's fascinating. And from everything that we have seen so far, it could really quite profoundly improve our productivity across many, many things. It's a great tool for us to make our daily lives and our daily work a lot better, including the creation of videos. You know, TikTok is about inspiring creativity and bringing joy. And you can imagine you know, using some of these creation tools for people to express themselves in a better way than before. You know, one part of our product vision is a canvas to create. You know, we have a window to discover, a canvas to create, and bridges to share. Now, on the creation part, you know, if we give people more tools, I think you can imagine a world where it's easier for people to express themselves. So that's, that's very exciting. Uh, what you mentioned is you know, the, the risks. You know, as with anything that's evolving so quickly, you know, of course you know, we should invest to understand the risks. And I think for AI, because it's so broad and so dynamic at this moment in time, you know, um, it is important that we understand the, what the technology can do. Mm. Uh, otherwise, you know, it's very hard to put guardrails on something we don't understand. Um, so yes, you know, I, I do agree that some form of thoughtful, careful regulation is necessary to make sure that we're building guardrails, but at the same time, not killing off the innovation on something that could be so exciting for all of us. And people are excited. Look, particularly when it comes to AI within social media, they think it will change social media. A lot, 73% of those in the audience do think that. How often at the moment, as the CEO of TikTok that is owned by a Chinese company. Are people asking you about regulation in China of AI vis-a-vis -vis in the US or 
globally, in the Middle East, in Europe? I think these are important uh, questions. You know, we are still studying them across the world uh, that TikTok operates in. Um, but uh, it's still very early. You mm. know, I, I personally think that uh, it could be a mixture of rules and transparency and disclosure. Because for something that's evolving so quickly, um, a lot of times it is, you put in some guardrails and it could be quickly outdated you know, um, because of the evolution of the technology. So uh, asking companies to be very forthcoming with disclosure, to be very transparent about what they're building, could be a very good way for us to better understand where the industry is headed. Transparency, disclosure, a lot of what you're advocating to make people feel comfortable with TikTok, whether it be in Europe or the US. Are you, do you have a plan B if you're banned in any state or country? Now, we believe that, you know, for an app that serves so many people uh, around the world, that is so deeply impactful, not only on expression, but on people's ability to connect. You know, mm. I hear so many stories. Uh, right before my hearing, I, I, got a, I got a very nice uh, message from one of our creators. Um, he's given me permission to talk about him. His name is Dylan Walker. And he told me that he lives with autism. And um, because of our platform, he has found his voice through music to connect with a community that he could not connect with before. And it's, it's this kind of connections, you know, th this deeply impactful, um, positive impact that our product has on people that gives me a lot of confidence that we can have very thoughtful conversations with regulators around the world. And I'm confident that we are here to stay, um, you know, not only because of the investments that we're putting in to keep the platform safe, but because of the, the impact it's having on the users themselves. You've got two kids. Do you think they will come on and would you be happy with them to interact with technology in the way that we do now as a society? I think it's very important for the next generation to be digitally, digitally savvy because they are going to live in that world. So, I mean, I don't want to speak for all parents. I think it's very important that parents make their individual decisions with their, with their children. But for me personally, I'm very comfortable with my children getting more involved with uh, understanding technology at an early age. And using a TikTok product from 13 onwards, do you think? Yes, absolutely. Ultimately, do you feel at the moment when it comes to the creator that you've become, 3.8 million followers that you have on TikTok and the like, are you able to express yourself there? Are you see, feeling any vulnerability there of your newfound fame? <laughs> well, um, I, I think it's very fun um, to be able to uh, express myself like that. And uh, I've been playing around with, you know, a lot more sophisticated video editing. By the way, every single video that I post is, uh, you know, that I, I go through the editing myself. Um, it's, it's very fun. And it's very, I think it's, it gives me a sense of, a, a stronger sense of community with our, with our uh, creators and our users. Um, I do interact with them on the app as well. It's been fantastic. And I see you are on as well. So <laughs> for those who are not following, please follow her. <laughs> well, vice versa to you. I have a few slightly fewer followers than you, it must be said, but I do all the editing myself too. <laughs> Joe, it was great to have some time with you. It went far too fast. We really appreciate you being here. Thank Joe you very Chu much. of TikTok, the CEO. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. Thank you.